Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Amanda Gonzalez. I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations here at SOULS. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today for our private practice panel for counselors and therapists. Today's event features two of our SOULS alumni who will share their experiences and insight as it pertains to running a private practice, specifically focusing on the business side of things. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started and introduce our panelists to you. Uh, and then they're going to share a little bit more about themselves as they're um, being introed or as um, they're speaking about themselves. Feel free to pop any questions you might have into the chat uh, and they'll have a chance to address your questions towards the end of our time together. First, I'd like to welcome Georgie Kelly. Georgie is a licensed professional clinical counselor who received their master's from the clinical mental health program at Souls back in 2015. They are a non-binary person who provides talk therapy and EDMDR to their clients, almost all of whom belong to the trans and non-binary communities. They also give educational presentations and gender-related consultation to mental health professionals. They completed most of their pre-licensed hours in private practice and have six years of experience in private practice alone. They are currently self-employed in a solo practice based in North County, Inland, here in California. Um, next, we have Christina Tretti, and she is a licensed marriage and family therapist and the owner of Integrative Family Therapy, or IFT. IFT is a small group practice in Encinitas that provides a relational and holistic approach to counseling parents, couples, and their families. Christina received her master's degree in marital and family therapy in 2017, and she's a double alumna of USD, having received her bachelor's in psychology. She has advanced training in emotionally focused therapy, serves as past chair on the board at the San Diego Center for EFT, and is certified in perinatal mental health with the Postpartum Support International. She's currently training to become an AAMFT, approved supervisor, and has a special interest in collaborating with new therapists seeking to practice emotionally focused therapy and relationship focused parent education. Uh, thank you both for joining us today. Um, Georgie, why don't you share a little bit more about your private practice? Okay, so I'm trying to think of things I didn't cover in my uh, bio. I, I feel like I was pretty thorough, but um, yeah, so I this was kind of my dream job. I always always wanted to do private practice. I always wanted to work with trans non-binary clients. Um, I guess at least, oh, I always wanted to work in private practice. The trans non-binary kind of specialty came along close to graduation. And so I'm thrilled that it kind of fell in my lap right after getting, you know, getting my master's degree. And I, I love what I do. And I'm just really excited to be here and share my experience. Thank you. Christina, did you want to share a little more? Yes. So I feel the same way as Georgie that a lot was already shared in the introduction. And I will say that I own a small group practice and called Integrative Family Therapy. We're based in Encinitas and it's also my dream job. I am so delighted that I'm able to have a flexible schedule and autonomy and I've got some great therapists on my team and I really really love what I do. Awesome. Um, so now we're going to get into some of the Q&A from some of our pre-populated questions um, and again to our participants if you have any questions that come up um, that don't get covered please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll ask them towards the end of the session. Um, so let's start with, you know, what made you want to go into private practice? We'll start with you, Georgie. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. As I said, like, I, I kind of always wanted to be in private practice. My uh, experience as a client was only with therapists who were in private practice. So that was really the setting I was most familiar with. I think um, I I think growing up, I didn't even understand that like therapists worked in other settings, which is kind of funny, but um, just, uh, yeah. So that was kind of my exposure to therapy in, in the first place. And then understanding that there's a lot of autonomy and kind of being able to set your own schedule and do what you need to do for yourself. Um, uh, 
uh, really appealed to me. Not a business person at all, but, um, you know, it was just, it seemed like a good fit. And then, um, as I kind of said, the, the dream job aspect fell right in my lap. I was asking, um, who the person who became my supervisor for information about, you know, I'm approaching graduation. I'm looking at her doing, you know, gender therapy and, and working in private practice. I'm like, Oh, that's my dream job. Tell me, tell me more about what you do and how you got into it. And, um, so we met for lunch and 45 minutes in, she's like, well, I'm actually looking for an associate. Do you want to work for me? And I'm like, Oh, how, how do I say no? There is, there is no, no, there's absolutely yes. Uh, right now let's do it. Like, <laughs> and so a couple months after, like just, um, uh, got started and it's, it's been wonderful ever since. Like I, I, she was my best supervisor I've ever had. I really lucked out. Um, I think we had a good sense about each other, but yeah, private practice just seemed really, I don't know, kind of like the natural thing to do. And then I know it working in, um, or at least interning in undergrad and graduate school, um, the, the, you know, the clinics that they place you in essentially, or the community mental health, I was kind of like, Oh, this is not, not the setting for me. <laughs> so I was really glad to kind of be able to separate from that and um, do what feels best to me. Mm -hmm. How about you, Christina? So my first position upon graduation was a very valuable experience for me. And at the same time, the schedule was really hard on me. I had to work nights and it was far away from home. And I was a single mom with three kids. And so I knew that probably the only way I could have a more flexible schedule would be to be in a private practice setting. So I sought out to find a private practice position as an associate. And I was very fortunate that I was able to get one. And uh, then I was able to have that more flexible schedule that allowed me to pick up my children from school and attend school plays and do the things that I needed to do and wanted to do as a mother while still being able to pursue my career. So I, I think that really is what had me know that I wanted to be in private practice. And then from there, I discovered too, that something that I loved about being in private practice was I could do the kind of work that I really wanted to do. And I could work with the kinds of clients that I really wanted to work with. I think there's good reasons to get other kinds of experience working with all sorts of populations. I'm, I, I'm grateful that I had that experience early on because I think it, we all need that to be well-rounded clinicians. But uh, ultimately, I love being able to you know, really work with the kinds of people and in the kind of setting that I want to work in. That's awesome. Um, and moving through, what kind of experience did either of you have, um, you know, with the business side of counseling or therapy before starting your own practice? You know, had you um, gone to a seminar or taken on any, any other courses that were available? There were no courses available. And, uh, and honestly, being an associate in private practice was amazing. And that's, that's what set me up. Like if I had not done that, I would have absolutely no clue what I was doing. Um, so it was really nice to kind of have my mentor, my supervisor and my experience all be in private practice before I got licensed and did my own thing. Yeah, I can relate to what you're saying, Georgie that the same thing happened for me. So no, I didn't take any courses, uh, but my supervisor provided so much mentorship for me. I don't know if all private practice settings are like that, but my supervisor and I had a very open, explicit agreement that what I would be doing while working for her would be gearing up to have my own practice as soon as I was licensed. And so she really provided the business mentorship too. And I'm so grateful for that. It seems like you both had some, um, you know, great mentors that kind of helped guide you um, as you made that transition. Yeah. Uh, with the business side, did either of you um, think to consult with a lawyer or anything like that before starting? Yeah, so I hired um, an accountant and a law firm that my accountant um, recommended. And that was 
super helpful. It's kind of like, I pay you to do things, please do things for me. And they do their jobs and it's amazing. Um, so I feel like, you know, my accountant provided guidance about like, get a QuickBooks account and here's a good payroll company. If you're going to do, yeah, I do an S corp. So that means I, I go through a payroll system to, to give myself the money that I'm making. Um, so he was great about, you know, kind of figuring out, you know, projected income and what to do with that information. And so anyways, the, and he said, let the law firm, I, I think I signed like three things and they're like, okay, your job is done. We took care of everything else. And I'm like, well, that was easy. So definitely worth the money. <laughs> yes. I also consulted with a lawyer. I, I actually didn't, when I first had my private practice, I, I had a private practice where it was just me, like a solo practice for a year. And then that's when I hired uh, my first employee. So when I hired my first employee is when I consulted with a lawyer, quite honestly, I probably should have <laughs> um, before, but, but I didn't. Um, and, uh, but, it, and yes, it's been great that, I mean, lawyers are expensive, but they do a really good job and they know what the law is. And so I still consult with the same lawyer on occasion as needed. And um, similar to Georgie, I have an accountant, I, I have a payroll system, and, and, and some of that was overwhelming, I'll say, like as I first got started. And, and now though, it's just, it's all in place and it's running really well. And I'm really grateful that I've got a team of people that are really smart and know what they're doing to handle some of that stuff for me. And about how long would you say it took you to get your private practice fully you know, up and running from the time where you decided you were going to go for it and do that to when, you know, you had your first client, you know, officially under your new practice. Shall I go first this time? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so I, uh, well, I would say it took about six months when I was pre-licensed. So when I was an associate, it, it I think it took me six months to get to the point where I had 20 clients. So Grant, again, I, this was not my own practice yet, but I was working in the private practice of my supervisor. So I was really fortunate that once I was licensed, it was like 30 days later that I had my own practice. Um, I mean, it might have even been two weeks later. I rented an office. I got um, simple practice. I got a bank account set up. I just really, you know, went for it and got everything together, but I was able to keep all of those clients and bring them over to my own practice. So that part worked really well. Uh, and now though, I'm, you know, in a different phase where I have therapists working for me and I, it's not as easy to fill up other therapists schedule. So right now I'm, I feel like I'm learning a lot about marketing and I'm learning a lot about being a business owner at this time. And there's a lot to it. So it's challenging, but also exciting. Yeah, I think for me, it took, I mean, my supervisor has such a, a niche of, um, you know, working with trans non-binary clients. And so at first I was kind of shaking anyone and everyone, which still wasn't very much. Um, I think to get, I mean, for one thing, so I don't see most of my clients weekly. Um, so, and I, I, so I kind of have like a, a very flexible schedule with my clients. We kind of do every other week and we kind of reassess the schedule every time, just about every time we meet. So knowing my current caseload is different than knowing my current schedule. Um, by now, like once I got licensed and actually became self-employed, like I've had a pretty busy, well, especially during quarantine everyone's packed. So it's been easy to kind of have a full schedule. So, um, I mean, just thinking about kind of how much, um, so like 15 clients per week is about average has been about average for me, uh, throughout the quarantine. I think I realized recently I have about 30 clients on my caseload. Um, so that's pretty full for me. Um, the, but like getting started, like working under my supervisor, like obviously she has, you know, she was over full, but I think part of the hard part about being an associate is you can't take insurance. 
you cannot take insurance. And so a lot of people who were used to working with therapists who did take insurance or expected, you know, they, they go to my supervisor and she's like, Oh, I don't take insurance, but my, you know, my associate has a sliding scale. Like that was, that was a, the finances were a lot of a, uh, a barrier for a lot of clients. So that, and then just getting my name out there, I think honestly, like six months to a year really before I started getting any traction. Um, and, but now it's like, you know, I was on psych today for a while and I just got off of it for so many reasons, but, um, I feel like I don't really have to focus on marketing anymore. It's just kind of like people just come in, um, which is great. Um, but yeah, and as uh, Christina was saying, like maybe once I got licensed, it was maybe two to three weeks when I, you know, set up, a, a consulted the accountant, got the law firm to do all the paperwork for me. Um, yeah, set up uh, the bank account, the payroll system, the QuickBooks, um, simple practice, the EHR. Um, and I think there were a couple other steps, but you know, with, with people kind of telling me what to do and, and suggesting next steps, it was like, oh, this is, this is super, super easy in a way. Yeah. Do you have to have any kind of separate licensure to be a private practice versus a group practice or anything? No, no, no different, no, no other license is needed or anything to be a group practice owner. Um, I just, but there's just employment laws to follow. And again, that's where the lawyer has been vital for me uh, and some mentors, people that are, I, I've got a great group of uh, group practice owners that have been owners for many years. And I, we meet regularly and I can ask them all my questions, but that part's been vital for me. Okay. Having, having a great lawyer and having seasoned group practice owners that I can go to with all my questions. So, yeah, I was going to say, I like, I can't be a supervisor until two years in, and that's uh, definitely my goal. So I've been licensed for barely over a year. So next year, hopefully I will be um, uh, supervising because I absolutely adore the idea and I'm super looking forward to it, but that doesn't require anything like separate necessarily, except for just the experience and some specifics to use to become a supervisor. But honestly, when you originally posed the question, Amanda, I was thinking like, oh, a certain business structure, which I have no idea. Like, I, I now I'm curious, Christina, what kind of like, are you an S corp? Are you? Yeah, yeah. I am an okay. S corp. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Or uh, um, for, so MFTs. I don't know if it's the same for for um, LPCCs. But is that what you are? Oh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so we, I have a professional corporation, a marriage and family therapy professional corporation. Okay. And it's that is required to be, to incorporate as an MFT. We have to go that route. I'm not sure if it's okay. like that for the other disciplines though. Yeah. I wasn't sure. I think I've heard okay. of that vaguely, but anyways, that's more logistics than we need to get into at this moment, <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for the insight. Good to know. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and in terms of location, how did you decide where to open your practice? Um, and in these times, what are your thoughts on, you know, doing um, telehealth? Did you start with doing telehealth before the pandemic hit? Where are you with it now? So I, I really wanted to work close to home. And um, so as a pre-licensed therapist, uh, when I was in the private practice, that office was very close to home in Encinitas. And then I also knew that I wanted my office to be in Encinitas. And so the office that I have, it's in Cardiff, which is just a neighborhood within Encinitas. And uh, it's just a single office, even though there's four of us therapists in the group. And when the pandemic started, I moved 100% to telehealth, but I kept the office because I was in a lease. And then that's also when I started hiring. So I do have one therapist that works for me that's in that office full time. And uh, he actually had a fairly easy time filling up, um, partly, I think, because of the pandemic, but then also partly because there aren't very many people offering in-person counseling right now. And he is. And so 
Um, I'm still doing everything telehealth and the two other therapists on the team also are doing telehealth. But my goal is absolutely to return to the office setting. I think for me, though, I'll be doing a hybrid. And right now I'm, I'm actually in process of looking around for a bigger office. And I for sure will stay in the Encinitas area. Um, I can see pros and cons to working in the same town that you live in. I think for some people, it might be nice to have a little bit of distance just for confidentiality and uh, having maybe a, a, be a better separation between work and personal family life. But for me, with just how busy I am and having lots of kids, being close to home and close to their school is super helpful. So um, yeah, I plan to stay in the Encinitas area forever, both in terms of my where I live and where I want my office to be. Yeah, so I, just starting out in private practice as an associate, you do have to work in the same office or have the same like business address essentially as your supervisor. So um, being in uh, working with the queer community at all, guess where your office is? It's in Hillcrest. Um, so at least in San Diego. So um, I was, I, I live in Rancho Bernardo. And um, so that was kind of a commute for me, but it was uh, obviously like, I would commute just about anywhere for my dream job. So, uh, you know, my supervisor worked in Hillcrest. So I, I commuted to Hillcrest during the quarantine. Um, we shifted to completely telehealth, of course. And um, so my supervisor gave up the lease like a year and a half in because we're like, who knows when we're going to go back. Um, so after that point, I got licensed. I started, um, you know, my own private, my own practice then got an office um, in Ranch Bernardo, thankfully a much shorter commute. Um, and I did that in August. I've been offering in person since September about, well, until I started taking on new clients again after that, which a lot of people are seeking in person therapy. So that's kind of a unique thing right now. Um, uh, until I started taking on new clients that were sp specifically seeking in person, I probably had maybe two or three clients coming in in person. Um, and, uh, you know, for a lot of people, I think some of the factors were that it's more convenient, but not only is it more convenient, I moved, you know, half an hour North uh, office wise. And so it's, it's more convenient for me, but a lot of my in-person clients previous to quarantine um, were expecting me to kind of stay in the same area. One of my potential goals is to have like two office locations, but now I'm like, now that I'm working alone and I'm like, oh, that's so much. <laughs> and also coordinating like which clients would, would see me where. Um, so that's another thing. But yeah, I, I kind of wanted to stay in Hillcrest once we gave up the lease. I'm like, oh, shorter commute. Heck, heck yes. So um, anyways, yeah, I think, I think it's subjective. I, originally, I loved the Hillcrest location mostly because, oh, I'm not going to see my clients at the grocery store. Um, and also, so that separation, but also um, uh, just being closer to the queer community, kind of queer, queer central um, in Hillcrest was kind of nice um, and convenient for a lot of people. But now it's like, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my office more than my clients are. I kind of deserve a shorter commute. So, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Christina, you mentioned that you do have employees um, working for you and with you. Georgie, do you have anyone working with you? No, I, I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, so Christina, do you only have other therapists or do you have like um, an assistant or anything like that too? So I have three LMFTs that work for me and I have a care coordinator who's also like, she's, she's our care coordinator and then she does uh, um, like, um, gosh, we call her practice. I don't know. I'm fumbling on this a practice assistant. <laughs> so she, she answers the phone. She returns phone calls. She returns emails. She helps me out with social media and she just really supports all of the therapists and all incoming clients. She's amazing. <laughs> And let's talk a little bit about insurance. Do you all accept insurance? How do you kind of navigate that? Or maybe you've left it up to just your lawyers to kind of deal with that? 
Uh, I refuse to work with insurance for about 3,000 reasons. <laughs> I, I think before I got licensed, I was thinking that, you know, I would have a kind of access to more referrals. I would build a caseload. If, so before getting licensed, no insurance company would work with an associate. Once I got licensed, I could work with insurance. However, um, the, yeah, just so many logistics in that. And I am full currently. So having more referrals is like, I don't need that. <laughs> and I don't need the headache of working with insurance. So I just, I have kind of a sliding scale. So, yeah. Yes, uh, we also do not work with insurance. I, I think again, sort of similar to Georgie. I, I actually thought I would take insurance, but then when I filled up, I realized I didn't need to. And it's something I contemplated when I became the group practice. But even then, uh, after having spent a fair amount of time looking into it, researching, even getting very close to beginning the process, I hired a biller and we started going down the road of uh, getting credentialed, I decided to stop and not continue with that. Uh, I think that for me in my practice, one reason why it doesn't necessarily make sense is because we primarily do couple therapy and family therapy. We aren't doing much individual therapy at all. And uh, it's, it's harder to get reimbursement for couple therapy and family therapy because it's not, we're not actually treating a mental health diagnosis. Uh, so it really works well for my practice. I also think though, I'll just say this, that I think it's great when people can utilize their health insurance to get counseling and therapy. I think it's important. And I've been able to create really great relationships with other practices in San Diego. And when people call us needing insurance, I refer them to those practices. And then I feel good knowing that, um, the folks that want to go through their insurance will still have a great therapist that they can go to. So yeah, that's where we're at with insurance. Thanks for sharing that. I think someone on the outside or you know, who doesn't have experience in this wouldn't really consider all the different ins and outs of things that you guys have already dealt with. Yeah. Uh, in terms of fees, how do you come up with your fees and your rates and how you charge people? Yeah, so um, starting in <clears throat> private practice as an associate, I charged a very low fee, a very low fee, and I would slide even below that, um, especially, you know, not being able to work with insurance and trying to get your name out there and trying to, so kind of a lower fee is a good marketing technique in some ways of like, um, just kind of getting, for one thing, getting experience, but also getting um, people to, I don't know, show up at all. Um, so, um, now and about every year, I think that I worked in private practice, I did raise my fee, um, but I still slid pretty low. Um, so now that I'm licensed, I raised everyone. Um, all my, all my clients had an increase in fees, um, when I got licensed and recently I raised my fees again for all my sliding scale clients. So that now I have a smaller range of sliding scale and that feels better to me. I have the current standard, like kind of standard fee for compared to most master's level therapists in the area. And I feel pretty good about that. So, yeah. So I feel like fees has been such a journey for me. I, I also, when I was an associate in private practice, you know, was low, and then I did sliding scale and, uh, it, and, and it was great. I mean, it was great. It was partly how I was able to build a caseload. And more recently though, I've gotten a little, well, not a little bit, like we just, we have a set fee. And then there's one reduced rate that we'll offer to for people that need a reduced rate. Uh, the way that I was able to establish the rate that we're currently at is I looked into other practices in San Diego. I really just went to their website for anyone that was offering emotionally focused therapy, couples therapy, which is the primary offering that we have. And I looked at what other people were charging. And then I charged like somewhere in the middle and it's worked. That works well for me. And um, I do think it's something to put time and energy into when you're starting 
And uh, I also think it can be really helpful to just get super clear about what it is that your fee is and then to hold, hold it. And uh, that's one thing I wish I had done earlier. Actually, I want to add something. Um, so some therapists will use kind of a, a grid or a formula to figure out their sliding scale, you know, kind of set their, their standard fee and then do some kind of math something. And I'm not a math person, so I don't know what that would be, but to kind of figure out what would be an appropriate fee for um, someone who has financial need. I go very unmath mathematized because I'm not a math person. And I asked the, per the client, what is a more affordable fee for you? I also, you know, having most of my clients every other week, that also makes it more affordable. So, um, so kind of offering that flexibility can be, um, uh, make it more accessible to people. Um, I feel like there was another thought with like, yeah. And kind of comparing to other practices was, yeah, what I basically did. My supervisor charges the same fee, even though she's been in the field, you know, over 10 years, I'm like, I, well, I am getting close to 10 years at this point. So I guess, you know, I, oh, I remember the other thing. It was that um, I think a lot of us have imposter syndrome and it's hard to charge money for our services because we're trying to help people, but you have a master's degree, you have experience, you have something valuable to offer people. And if you don't want to charge them, I understand. I totally get that. Uh, sometimes I actually forget that I'm actually getting paid for this job because I just love it so much, but also your time is worth something fees are kind of part of self-care. If you can't pay the bills, you're not doing your job essentially. So um, don't undervalue yourself. Your, your, your experience is worth something and your expertise. I think that is great advice. Um, what is one or two maybe thing that you really wish that you had known about you know, owning and operating your own private practice before you had got, gotten started? So for me, when I started, I was not expecting to have therapists working for me. Um, and so when I started, the name of my practice was Christina Treddy Couple Therapy. And then it was just a year later that I decided to hire and when I hired, the advice everyone gave me was you don't want your practice to be your, your name, because if you do that, then people are only going to want to work with you. So it's better just to pick a more general name. And so then I had to change my name and not only did, well, I didn't have to change my name, but I decided to change the practice name. And then I also had a lot of different systems already in place based on that name. So one thing I wish I had at least considered was do I think I might want to become a group one day and have people working for me? Uh, I might have not known, you know, I might have still just decided at that point that I would have just wanted to be in solo practice long term, but I didn't even think about it. So I think that's one thing that I would say that anyone that is intending to start their own practice, at least spend a little bit of time considering whether or not you want to become a group one day, because it might shift some of the decisions that you make early on. And then one thing that I am learning right now, as I already mentioned, is I'm learning how to be a business owner. And it's a very different skill set than being a therapist. And uh, I, I feel like right now I'm kind of playing catch up because I've had therapists working for me for about a year now. And now I'm starting to really learn how to shift into that role of business owner. And it would have been great if I had learned more about this even a year ago. So I think that's something too, that if um, any of you think that you might want to have employees, it's probably never too early to start learning how to be a business owner, which is different than being a therapist or a counselor. Yeah, I agree. I am, um, my current corporation name is my name and I'm kind of like, Oh, well, and I, when I originally kind of got licensed, I was like, oh, I may or may not have supervisees. And now I'm like, I definitely want supervisees. I feel like that's going to be an awesome experience for me and hopefully them. Um, but uh, yeah, so now I'm like, hmm, maybe I, I, I will end up changing my, my business name as well. But the other thing I was just going to say was I didn't realize how valuable an accountant could be. Like that was like, you know, 
amazing. As I said, he really gave me the the step-by-step kind of, this is what you want to do based on your projected income, which I of course had some guests from working in private practice under my um, supervisor. But otherwise, if I'd have started and my private practice self-employed without any of that experience, I would have been totally lost. Um, But I was at least able to tell him like a number and he's like, okay, so based on that, let's do this business structure and let's, you know, here's the things you need to do to make that work. So otherwise I would have been like, so what is a business? Like it would, I would have been very, very lost. So I'm very glad that he actually knows what he's doing. He translates what he, uh, so he's speaking accountant and legal stuff all the time. And I'm like, so what do I actually do? And he translates it into English, into action steps. And I'm like, I can do that. So (laughs) that's super helpful. Thank you for that. I'm sure our participants participants appreciate that. Um, And then tying it back into souls and your education from here, your alumni, um, is there anything from your time at souls, any classes or connections that you made through and networking that helped prepare you to run your own private practice? So, I believe that the programs at USD and Souls has a really great reputation in our community. And so I do think that having graduated from the program established some credibility for me that I might have not had if I had gone elsewhere. I don't know, of course, but that's just the feedback that I've received from different people over the years. I also established relationships with my peers when I was in school that I'm, and I'm still in contact with a lot of these therapists today, and we refer back and forth to each other. And uh, I think that they've been very helpful in sending clients my way to my practice, as I believe I've probably been helpful in sending clients to them too. And that's something that I've really discovered is that often therapists and counselors want to refer to people that they know and trust. When, when a client comes to me that for whatever reason, I'm not a good fit, I really want to find them a great therapist. And I'm most likely to refer them to someone that I know and trust. So I would say that if you are creating connections with your peers in school, like hang on to those relationships because they're going to be so invaluable as you continue this career. And then I will also say this in like a roundabout way, I I discovered emotionally focused therapy when I was in school and loved the model. And it just very much resonated with me. And I started training with uh, the EFT community right upon graduation. And I've continued my training in EFT and a lot of my referrals just come from other EFT therapists. So, um, goodness, I mean, I would say absolutely that in many ways, Souls has contributed to the success of my practice. Yeah, I would agree with a lot of that. I think, yeah, the networking, the having the ability to have colleagues that are strong in what they do, that, you know, having that kind of referral network. I think another thing that has helped is that, um, my, my uh, classmates knew that I was specializing in the queer community and trans and non-binary clients. So I get asked to do a lot of presentations, partially because like guest lectures, presentations, because of connections I made at USD. And that's been really helpful. I've also done presentations for USD classes. Um, and that is a good thing. Um, the other thing I was um, thinking about was I feel like I didn't get, of course, a lot of business kind of training of, from a counseling program, which you kind of would expect. But I think that may neglect the fact that people are going to be self-employed. So like if you're going into a clinic or community mental health, like having strong clinical skills is kind of all, all you need in some ways. Um, and so, so on the flip side of that, I think having confidence in my clinical skills and having that be so strong because of my education at USD allowed me to kind of then not worry about that and then focus on, okay, what the hell am I doing with this private practice self-employed stuff and not worry about like the clinical side of things. Cause I knew that was solid. 
Thank you for that. Um, do any of our participants have any additional questions, something that um, our panelists haven't gone over yet? I have a quick question. Um, do you have any tips for like post master's jobs? Like I know you said you guys both worked with or like worked in a private practice setting, but do you have any tips on like finding a job like that? Or is it just kind of like networking? It's definitely networking. I mean, in my experience, like I had, I, as I said, like I was, you know, interviewing a couple of people in the community that had my dream job. And I was like, okay, someday I'm going to get there. But um, yeah, so, and I got their names from other people in the queer community or connected to the queer community. So I, that was how I kind of made those connections. But, um, and I lucked out that Darlene happened to be looking for an associate at that time. Um, but honestly, like I stay connected to USD partially because I want to supervise, like I, I'm part of the mentor collective program. Um, and so I think, yeah, networking and knowing who, you know, is, is going to be invaluable. Um, cause I think, you know, you never know who could be hiring in the future. You never know what connections are going to, are going to pan out. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'll add to that a little bit that, um, you can definitely find company or you know private practices or group practices that are hiring pre-licensed therapists and i think people will put ads on indeed for example that's a good place to look but uh also i think you can be bold and uh reach out to someone if there was someone that you felt like they had the niche that you were interested in pursuing or there was a particular model that they practice that you're really interested in. I think being able to email them and introduce yourself and uh, open up the conversation, it could potentially lead to a job. You'd probably be more likely to have that kind of Oh no! Oh no! For us. <laughs> yeah. Oh goodness. Yeah. While we wait for her to come back on, does anyone else have a question? I guess everyone's ready to open a private practice tomorrow. We're set. We've been completely thorough. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been a really helpful and insightful, uh, especially someone like myself who has no experience um, in <laughs> counseling or therapy uh, knowledge whatsoever. Um, it's been really eye-opening for me. There's so much that you don't know about this, you know, the, the other end of what you're wanting to do, you know. Like you said, you studied, you got your degree, you focused on, you know, being the best counselor that you can be, and then on the flip side, you had to try and open your own practice. Um, mm -hmm. So hiring folks that can help you do that, I think is helpful. Yeah, yeah, definitely having a support system in all possible ways is, is great. Mm -hmm. Last call for questions. I do have a question. Um, thank you so much for sharing today. Um, I know that uh, you talk about you know, finding an accountant, finding an attorney to kind of set up the, the practice. And I'm assuming that that's probably the first step to kind of actually get things started and get things rolling. And how about on your website, like doing stuff that, you know, the marketing job, like just how to like get the first step, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I think um, I, as you were talking, I was like, oh, how did I get connected even to the accountant and the lawyer? So the lawyer was recommended by my accountant. My accountant had to be happened to be someone that I knew um, actually has a connection to USD. Um, uh, and so that that was helpful. I feel like I had another thought there. But um, 
so one thing was when I was working as an associate, my supervisor gave me, it gave me, had, had a page for me on her website. Um, and that was helpful getting a psych today profile psych today is psychology today, sorry, is the most widely used way to find therapists. So I think marketing on there can be really helpful. It does cost. Um, but I, I got off there for, as I said, a few reasons, but, um, I'm listed somewhere else on therapy den, um, which is pretty cool. And that one is free. Um, but yeah, I made business cards and I, you know, every presentation, every client, everyone got business cards when I was uh, starting out. Um, and as far as my own website, I have a Google workspace account for, um, basically just for my website to kind of figure that out. Um, and so I, I used Google sites to design my own thing. I, I love kind of graphic design and writing, making content essentially. Um, so I was able to do that. Um, and, and I had a custom domain that I made for Google workspace. Um, trying to think of other aspects that might be helpful to think about. I think those are the main things that I can, I can think of off the top of my head. If you have other questions about that, let, let me know. That's actually really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Good question. Anyone else? This may be like a weird question. Um, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it's kind of like a multiple part question. Um, but I, I've heard that like usually with private practice, um, if you're not taking insurance, you don't necessarily need to diagnose. So I guess kind of like my first question is, do you diagnose? Um, and then also, I guess my next question is, um, like, what do you use for like, uh, like all your documents and client, um, I don't know, I guess just like client documents and stuff like that. Like, what do you use to keep that all organized? Absolutely. So my supervisor used a different um, EHR or electronic health record, but I use simple practice, which I've been super happy with. Um, uh, so yeah, so uh, there are EHRs out there. There's several options. Um, it's good to um, kind of figure out what, what feels best to you. Um, you know, some have features that others don't. Some have telehealth integrated, some don't. Uh, sometimes it's an add-on. Just thinking about what you want out of, you know, kind of client documentation, what do you want to have um, available to you? Um, as far as the first question, yeah, so I, <laughs> I loved my diagnosis class in graduate school. I loved my, you know, abnormal psych in undergrad. And now I'm like, why would I diagnose in some ways? Um, so I'm kind of anti-diagnosis at this point in my career, but um, and since I don't work with insurance, I don't technically have to have, well, so for insurance, you have to have, you know, a documented diagnosis. However, like ethically and clinically, you do need to document some kind of thing. Um, so uh, I, I do use adjustment disorder quite a bit, but also I, I kind of use like major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder quite, kind of frequently, just have something on file. But, you know, presenting concerns can be all over the place. And so I think, um, anyways more clinical side, but essentially, um, for me, I, I don't, I don't really rely on diagnosis. And since I don't have to document like anything for insurance, no one's like checking my work. Essentially. I just kind of put broad categories. Thank you. You're welcome. Christina, I don't know if you want us to restate the question or to add to anything. Sure. If you could restate the question, I'm sorry, my zoom just shut down for some reason. So, but I am back. Yeah, I think the question was kind of client documentation, how we keep track of all those things. And then also if diagnosis isn't required for insurance, what is uh, kind of how do you handle that if you don't work with insurance? Yeah. Okay. So I use simple practice. It sounds like you do as well. And it makes documentation very easy. And uh, I love it too, because I can look at the notes of my team and just make sure that everyone's on top of everything. And uh, we are an EFT-based practice, and one of the 
principles of EFT is that we're non-pathologizing. Um, sometimes we give a diagnosis. If there's a true diagnosis, we would. But as I mentioned before, we are primarily doing couple and family therapy and uh, we're not doing individual counseling. So we often don't give a diagnosis at my practice. Uh, we might use a Z code for that just sort of indicates that there's relationship problems or parent child conflict. That's pretty common, but, uh, but again, mostly with couple and family therapy, that's what we're doing is we're doing couple and family therapy and not everyone that comes to us has a mental health diagnosis. Christina, did you want to go back to the previous question? Sure. Yes. And again, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, so yes, I was um, I was teaching this parenting course at a at a yoga studio, and the and owner of the studio asked me if I was interested in renting a room. I explained I couldn't, and he also asked an LMFT who is the woman that became my supervisor. And the way that worked was the three of us all came together in a meeting and I explained where I was at in my career and that I was working at an agency at that time, but would love to have the opportunity to work for her. And she and I had a couple more conversations and she ended up renting that space and employed me. And I was able to work for her. And in that setting, I was also able to run groups and teach workshops so it was, it was really a dream come true for me. And I think if I had not really gone for it, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, so meaning that like, I, um, like when the owner of that studio approached me and the other therapist, I was the one that brought up the idea of me working for her as her associate. Um, she didn't just come up with that idea on her own. I really put myself out there and it all came together. And so I guess my point in sharing that is that I think it's okay to, to do that. And I would encourage you all, if you're interested in working in a private practice as a pre-licensed therapist to see if there are people that maybe have the niche that you're interested in and just reach out to them. You never know what can happen. It seems like that worked out for both you and Georgie in these situations. Yeah. Anyone else with any further questions? I have to, okay. I have to, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Maybe it's not quite relevant, but I'm actually kind of interesting to know uh, if you all um, had thought about doing like multi state licensures because telehealth has been so popular right now and people would just, um, you know, go to other states to see clients or they would like, you know, get licensed in multiple states. So I wonder if you, uh, if any of you have any thoughts about that. I have definitely considered it. I've had three or four clients at least over the quarantine move. And I think at least two of them went to Portland. And I'm like, ooh, if I got licensed in Oregon, I could still follow my clients because I absolutely uh, adore, I, I was really connected to those two. Um, anyways, so I have considered uh, that specifically, but also I have to consider my own boundaries and to be licensed out of state, you do need to, uh, the NCMHCE that we take in California does cover a lot of other states for licensure. So you don't have to take the NC as well for some states. Um, so Oregon specifically has a lot of good reciprocity there. And, but you do have to keep up with, of course, their CEU schedule and their like, you know, licensing renewal fee. So, and it seems like it's easier once you've been licensed for two to five years to get that reciprocity in other states. So yeah, I've looked into it. <laughs> I've, I've thought about it and there might be a time in the future that I would do something like that. I think for me, my hope is to really get solidly established in Encinitas and really become a place where it becomes a part of the community offering. And um, especially too, because we're working with families and couples and I've got, I've got children um, at the age that a lot of our families are coming in. 
And right now, too, I'm beginning to do more networking and relationship building with allied professionals in the Encinitas area. So the way I see things going is moving into a bigger space in Encinitas and still providing telehealth just so because it's convenient. And we do get folks from other parts of California. Absolutely. And I love that we can do that. Uh, but I think for me, I'm really wanting to stay local, but you never know. <laughs> it, I also never thought that I would have people working for me and I do. So it could change. Thank you. I guess going back, I was just realizing I didn't answer part of our question earlier was um, kind of into the future, at, you know, pandemic and quarantine and telehealth and all those things. Um, so pre pandemic, I had never done a virtual like online counseling session. And now obviously I, I do it all the time. And um, uh, I definitely want to continue telehealth forever, essentially. So I think that also contributes to my like willingness to look into other states um, to get licensed. And, you know, I, I was, I was terrible at video chat. I was actually, I shouldn't say I was terrible at, I was terrified of video chat for any reason before, um, before the pandemic. And now I'm like, oh, this, this is, you know, super comfortable and I get to work at home and that's, that's great. So, um, telehealth has just been kind of revolutionary in, in my life. And I've really appreciated kind of being forced into it because now I see how, good it is for me and my clients. What would you say is your, was your biggest struggle in moving to telehealth? You said it was terrifying for you. Oh yeah. I think I was, I, I just wasn't comfortable with video chat, like personally. And so like having to do it professionally kind of was scary. Also trying to figure out like where am I going to have a good background and how am I going to have a good chair <laughs> and like just working from home all of a sudden was kind of a, you know, a different thing. And so I think telehealth, especially since it was like, Oh, we're going to do this for two weeks and we'll be back, you know, it'll be fine. And then having to do it long-term and like not knowing when it'll end is like, Oh, I really have to set this up now. I have to, you know, make sure my, I don't know. So I think it was just an adjustment working from home and having clients like in my home, essentially, you know, like my home is not, well, it's not set up for clients in so many ways. And so just having that kind of um, different dynamic um, was, was an adjustment. I also, I, this is kind of a side note, but I hug a lot of my clients and it's been really sad to not hug my clients during pandemic times. So yeah, that was an adjustment too. I love that you hug your clients. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was one of those people in, in at least undergrad that was like, I'm never going to hug my clients. I'm being taught to never touch my clients and all this stuff. And now I'm like, oh my God, I've had so many clients like ask for a hug. And now uh, half of them, it would be, uh, well, pre-pandemic, we would hug at the end of every session. That's just what we do. And I'm like, this is amazing. So anyways, thanks for the support. Because I think a lot of times we're taught like boundaries and it's like, eh. <laughs> there's still boundaries there, but it's, it's still, you know, it can be a safe and connecting thing to how your therapist. So, yeah. yeah. I think for me, um, the challenge of telehealth has been that it, it's mostly been with high conflict couples. So, um, and, and we get a, a lot of high conflict couples coming through our practice where um, there can be, you know, yelling, name calling, and of course we, we handle it and we're trained really well to handle it. And we know how to intervene and, and contain and create safety in session. But that's been probably the hardest thing about seeing couples over telehealth, because when we're in the room with each other, there's something I think just about my physical presence and my ability. It's almost like, I feel like I can get in between them, even if I'm not actually really getting in between them. So that's something I've had to learn how to work with over telehealth. Uh, and though, I mean, yeah, it's been so beneficial in so many ways. The convenience of it, um, has been tremendous for me personally. And then also I think for a lot of couples, 
who maybe wouldn't have done couples therapy before because they have such busy schedules. Now they can even be on their lunch break at work and one person can be, or one person could be at like their office and someone else can be at their office and then we can all come together. And that's something that never could have happened before. So there's definitely parts of it that I love and that I think have been really beneficial that I don't ever want to let go of. And then there's elements of it where I'm excited to, be back in an office setting with them soon. Do you find that the majority of your couples doing telehealth are on their own separate screen or, you know, in their own different rooms or are they on one in one room? The majority are in one room. And I do also recommend that they're in one room just because part of what we're trying to do is create that connection and closeness and bonding and have them be together. Um, and I think they get more out of, out of the work if they're in the same space with each other. And though at the same time, if it comes down to like no therapy at all or therapy, but in different locations, I'd rather they be able to have, have the therapy, but still do it from different locations. Oh, and I'll say this too, and this is sort of in line with the piece around uh, doing telehealth and being licensed in other states, is we do a lot of family therapy too, and this is a really common request now for family therapy with all adults, um, adult family members, but people live all over the U.S., <laughs> and uh, it I think there's a lot of families actually that have struggled through this pandemic for all sorts of reasons. And they're wanting to do family therapy, but they can't find a therapist that is licensed in multiple States. And so now they're going without the family therapy, which is really unfortunate. So I know that there's talk of being able to provide some sort of national license or reciprocity that makes this easier for all of us, but I don't really know where I don't know much about that, but I've heard people talk about that. And I, that would be incredible for our professions mm -hmm. if that ends up happening and for our clients. <laughs> Another last call for final questions. I don't have any more questions, but I want to say thank you so much uh, for taking your time to um, talk with us today. And I definitely learned so much. And oh my God, my dog is playing with her duck toy. Sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I just want to say thank you so much. I definitely learned a lot. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, that's awesome. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here with you all too. Yeah, I also want to thank you so much for um, um, to share your experience with us today. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Um, and I think that especially what Christina said about um, high conflict couples, um, I, I am thinking about having my own private practice, but I came from a community agency, community mental health agency. So it's kind of hard to, to kind of imagine how it would be like to do telehealth with couples. But I think, you know, I think you gave me some direction. So I, I think it would, be, it would be nice for me to get started. So thank you. You're welcome. All right. With that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up today's session. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you have folks that you know that weren't able to attend or that um, didn't register and were so interested, we are going to be putting the recording up on YouTube in the coming days. Um, so you can refer them there uh, and we'll also email it out to all the registrants, especially for those who couldn't join us today. Um, Thank you so much to both of you for participating in the panel. It was so insightful, I think, and very helpful for, um, it looks like mostly students joined us today. Um, and I know they appreciate it, and I am so grateful as well. Well, yeah, you're welcome. This was a great experience. Glad to share what I've got. Me too. I appreciate the time with everyone today, and I'm also appreciating the questions that you asked. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night.